Good morning, everyone. I'm Linda Raines, CEO of Brain Futures. I want to thank you all for being here this morning. Um, I've had a lot of questions walking in the door. Um, who is Brain Futures? What, how, what, where did they come from, and how are they connected to the Mental Health Association? Um, so Brain Futures launched in 2015 um, because its parent organization, the Mental Health Association, was stunned and awed by the incredible promise of recent neuroscience advances for both the treatment of brain illness and to optimize our potential as human beings. Today, we're focused on the latter, a brain fitness agenda for youth. In my 30 years in this field, I cannot think of a scientific advance that has more potential to transform lives than the discovery of lifelong brain plasticity. Smile, Bruce. <laughs> You've been working at it your whole lifetime. Um, all around us, we've seen evidence of the results these programs are achieving. Just a few years ago, Tom Brady and Matt Ryan both used brain training technology to lead their teams in the Super Bowl. Not a sports fan, don't remember who won. Um, <laughs> our elite military forces rely on these technology innovations in their sensitive and dangerous work. The first video game for the treatment of a mental health condition is working its way through the FDA pipeline. Um, at the National Brain Science Conferences we've convened, we heard a recurring refrain among educators, health and aging providers, employers, how do we know what works? What is backed by solid science? Today, we are responding to those questions with our first issue brief. I want you all to take this home. You have no idea how heavy they are and how hard it was for the <laughs> staff to bring a hundred of these things down, a pound a piece. Um, but this issue brief um, is the first in a brain fitness series that we are launching this year. And we've targeted this one to an audience that not, could not be more important to all of us, our children. Today's paper shares objective information. It's also a platform for action. In fact, that really is its primary purpose. Um, if, you hear, if you find what you hear today compelling and are wondering about your own brain, fear not. Later this year, we're releasing brain fitness agendas for the aging brain and for the workplace, so stay tuned. In advancing today's platform for change, we relied heavily on the foundational work of the Kennedy Forum, our partner in today's event. Now I have the honor of introducing Amy Kennedy, the education director for the Kennedy Forum, which she and Patrick founded five years ago to advance the fight for mental health parity and policy reform. She brings with her the finely honed multitasking skills of a mother of five, the practical sensibilities of a veteran educator in our public school system, and the passion of an advocate fighting to bring out the best in all kids. Please join me in warmly welcoming Amy. Thank you so much, Linda. It's so exciting to hear you talk about optimizing their brain neuroplasticity. For my uh, five kids, I want to see them have every opportunity to be lifelong learners. I am excited to be here because when Patrick and I founded the Kennedy Forum in 2013, it was our goal to unite mental health advocates and connect them with policymakers, and also business leaders. So the idea that you're going to be publishing a report that'll help not only children, but work in many different settings uh, brings that to mind. In 2016, we released a report titled Promoting Brain Health and Brain Fitness, a National Call for Action. Now we're in 2019, we're waiting for the action, and I really believe that it is your report, that'll make that easier to implement. Our report found that there was a large disconnect between children and young adults' cognitive and emotional needs and what they actually learn in school. I taught school for 14 years in New Jersey. I know that there's a lot of work to do. It ultimately concluded that the United States educational system needs significantly to improve students' capacities to learn and thrive throughout life by utilizing evidence-based brain fitness programs. 
evidence-based programs is what you've done here in this report to be able to outline what things will be able to best mitigate the negative impacts associated with ACEs with uh, also helping them with social integration, physical well-being, and addressing them early. By improving students' executive function, brain fitness programs can improve students' success in school and in life. In this rapidly developing area, there's more digital applications every year, and trying to be able to organize those and sort through them can be challenging for school districts. Brain Futures new report aims to change that. The Kennedy Forum believes this report will make a tremendous difference. We urge school decision makers and policy makers to prioritize brain fitness strategies and social emotional learning, not only for the benefit of individuals, but for the benefit of society at large. To the Brain Futures team, I'd like to say you've done an amazing job here, and I'm proud to serve as your advisor. Thank you. Next, you will have the opportunity to hear from an esteemed leader in the field of neuroscience, Dr. Bruce Wexler, Professor Emeritus of Psychiatry and Senior Research Scientist at the Yale School of Medicine. Bruce has been internationally recognized for his work in understanding of advancing understanding of brain plasticity and its practical application. He's been an incredible mentor to all of us on the Brain Futures team and is one of the rare scientists who can share the science of executive function in a way that is crystal clear even to those of us who are not neuroscientists. Welcome, Bruce. Well, good morning. Thank you, Linda. Thank you all for coming. There was a international study done comparing academic outcomes in students from 35 countries. The United States students ranked 19th in science, 20th in reading, and 30th in mathematics out of 35 countries. Here at home, we have a very shameful problem of the disparity in academic outcomes as a function of income. Children raised in poverty are three times more likely to perform below proficiency in state exams and half as likely to score in the, proficient, in the highly proficient range. So what we're doing isn't working very well. And too many students are headed for lives as young adults without the cognitive executive skills and social emotional skills they need to make, to become productive members of our society rather than burdens on the society. Executive cognitive functions are essential for learning. There are a set of cognitive functions that are supported by overlapping neural systems in the, largely in the frontal and parietal areas of the brain, and that's one of the reasons we group them together. But they, as collectively, enable us to manage information and manage ourselves. Examples of the primary ones of these executive functions are, are self-control, memory, cognitive flexibility, and the ability to focus attention, especially in the presence of distraction. Decades of research have shown that executive cognitive functions are more powerful predictors of academic success than is IQ. Children with compromised attention in third grade are eight times more likely to become high school dropouts. But the effects and importance of executive function don't stop in elementary school or high school. This study followed 1,000 children starting when they were three years old and followed them until they were in their early 30s with an amazing ability to have followed 985 out of the uh, 1,000 that, that started the study. And they found that not only do these executive functions, when assessed in childhood, predict academic success, not only do kids with low executive function 
uh, be become more likely to use drugs, to have motor vehicle accidents, engage in unsafe sex. But beyond that, they have lower income, poorer career outcomes as they enter into their 20s and 30s, more likely to have legal problems, continued problems with drug abuse, and it actually impacts their physical health. Cardiometabolic health is compromised by poor executive functions. Poverty compromises another series of studies done over decades again. And as Amy said, this information has been available for a while. Decades of research have established that poverty compromises the development of executive cognitive functions. So there's no mystery why children from poverty are not doing as well in school. And we understand a number of the reasons why. Uh, parents, children in poverty, often their parents are worried about paying, paying the rent. Some may be working two jobs. They're tired. There's more likely to be single parent families, more likely to be drug, drug abuse and other problems in the families. So collectively, the parents have less time and less energy just to talk to the children. When they do talk to the children, they talk in shorter sentences, more limited vocabulary, less complex cognitive structures to help the child imitate and learn. When they discipline the child, they discipline in a way that does not foster the same type of, of cognitive growth. It's, thought, it, it's also demonstrated that, in general, a parents with poor executive function have children with poor executive function. So this is part of the mechanism of the transgenerational transmission of poverty that we can break if we can intervene to improve executive cognitive functions. So not only do children in poverty fail to get the good stuff, and their parents don't have the money to buy the, ba the, the, the best toys that are going to uh, promote their cognitive development, they don't have the time or money to take them to the science museums and other events like that. But not only do they miss out on this good stuff, they get bad stuff. Because secondhand smoke, disrupted sleep, poor nutrition, exposure to violence. One study in Chicago, they uh, monitored children prospectively to see how much they slept at night, and they measured their stress hormones in the morning. And if there's one murder in their neighborhood, in their neighborhood, the children in that neighborhood slept a half hour less and had higher cortisol levels the next morning. The effects of poverty on brain development are as evident as early as nine months of age. So this is a study of a electrophysiology study of the EEG patterns. And what the red represents is the amount of EEG activity that's associated with executive functions. This amount of electrophysiological electro activity of this type, this, this particular power spectrum, when you're a child, or when you're very young, predicts your executive function skills. And you can see in the low-income children that the band of red is thinner than the band of red in the children from high income. So by nine months, their brain development is already lagging behind in the ways critical for life success. You can't pour water into a bottle when the lid's closed, right? So what is it that's going on in so many of our schools? Well, kids aren't learning math. Let's pour some more math in. Let's, let's spend more money on more math. Well, they're not learning reading. Let's pour some more reading in. It won't go in. They need the executive cognitive skills to open the jar for learning. The human brain has 86 billion neurons, each one directly connected to 1,000 other ones, and each one getting hundreds of inputs in a thousandth of a second. But how does it work? How does it work to do uh, thinking, executive function, emotions? These functions are the result of the integrated action of hundreds of thousands of neurons spread around the brain. This is a modern understanding of how the brain works. You can see the, the picture here on one side is the 19th century understanding. The idea that each of our cognitive functions, even our moral qualities, were located in a specific region of the brain. 
that idea is hard for many scientists to give up, to tell you the truth. But in fact, that's not the way it works. We know that the brain works by dynamically reconfiguring neural systems. And it's these neural systems that support our thinking. So that raises a new question. Where do the connections come between the neurons that create the neural systems? Hubel and Weisel were given the Nobel Prize for demonstrating the degree to which the structure and function of the brain are shaped after birth by stimulation from the environment. This is more true of human beings than any other animal. We human beings are the only animals that change the environment that changes our brain. That's a very powerful dynamic, unique to us. We call that cultural evolution. And that's responsible for many very good things about human beings. But the downside of that is, if you don't get the cognitive stimulation you need, your brain won't develop. This is an example, and there are many others. This is an example of the effect on your brain, the actual structure of your brain, if you practice a musical instrument for many hours as a child. And do I actually have a pointer? I do. Oh. Um, If you play the violin, your left hand does a lot of fancy fingering movements. Your right hand does relatively simple bowing movements. Now, the right hand is controlled by the sensory motor area in the left side of the brain. So if you look at the left side of the brain here, the area encircled is a sensory motor area connected with this relatively simple movement of the bow. The right side is connected with the complex movements of your fingers. And I don't know if you can see all the way in the back, but most of you can see with the naked eye, the volume expansion in that area of the brain associated with practicing the violin for many hours so that you have all these complex movements. This is volume expansion is because, is because of the increase in richness and number of connections between the neurons in these neural circuits. The bottom side is a piano player. He uses both hands and has two of these buffed up motor cortices. So this is the opportunity. I tried to give you an idea of the neuroscience basis and how confident we are of what the problem is. We understand a lot about where it comes from. But from a neuroscientist's point of view, it's a pretty straight shot. We know these cognitive executive functions are predict academic outcome. We know they're compromised by poverty. I looked at that and I said, we know the brain's neuroplastic. We can drive the development of those neural systems to support executive cognitive function by creating certain programs. And so this is the opportunity that we can harness the brain's neuroplastic potential to address and mitigate, as Amy said, the effects of poverty on cognitive development. So I call these set of programs school lunch programs for the brain. Because if kids come to school without enough food, we can give them food at school. They'll actually grow faster and catch up to their growth potential. What we and what these programs do is provide the food the brain needs and the rest and relaxation the brain needs in, with the meditation programs in order for it to grow and catch up to its potential. So thank you for being here, showing the level of interest that you do by being here, but also by the other work you're doing. And I hope that all of us together can start to make the impact that the Kennedy Forum was hoping would start in 2015. We can start it now. Thank you. Thanks so much, Bruce. Now I'm pleased to introduce and thank our lead author, Holly McCormick. Together with her writing partner, Chris O'Brien, Holly went above and beyond on this project. I think we originally envisioned a little 20-page paper. Now it's a book. Um, so I want to thank her here in front of all of you um, for the extraordinary hours that she donated to make this paper shine. Thank you, Holly. Um, she's worked in higher education for 20 years, currently as Dean for Career Development at Kenyon College. She authored the 2015 Kennedy Forum brief that Amy mentioned and that we relied on so heavily in preparing this document. Please welcome Holly. Good 
Good morning, everybody. Uh, as Chris O'Brien and I were working on this report, we, uh, one, were grateful for the opportunity to be able to dive in again and be reminded of a few things uh, in an iteratively throughout the, the process. And one is that um, the risks are too high to do nothing. <coughs> Excuse me. The risks are really too high to do nothing. And we really, we know this, and I think Bruce uh, did an excellent job of explaining uh, why that's the case. The second is that um, we can do something, right? That, that these are programs that are, that are available, uh, that there's, there's the evidence uh, to these, uh, that, um, out there for these programs so that decision makers can rely, uh, with, with, um, rely on the evidence when trying to bring these programs to their constituents. And that when these programs are introduced, it, as, again, as Bruce was mentioning, it not only has an impact on the academic trajectory of the students, but also on their lifelong trajectory. And it is a practical way to actually interrupt the achievement gap. So um, with the rapid growth of executive function programs, uh, it does beg the question, what's been missing? So I'm just gonna take a moment to figure out, perfect, okay. And what's been missing is a way to make sense of it all. Thank you very much. Um, there are a number of programs out there and growing and more growing every day. Uh, there is an, an enormous amount of research. I can say from the time we wrote the Kennedy Forum paper to, uh, to this uh, issue brief, the amount of research has just grown exponentially. So there is no dearth of evidence for this work. But a way to make sense of it all uh, is something that um, was needed. So this report that Brain Futures offers does a few different things. One, it offers a very concise summary of the different types of uh, executive function program categories. And I'll get into a little bit more of that in the next slide or, or two. It also offers a really transparent rubric uh, that's evidence-based that any reader could use and apply to evaluate uh, any other program either in the report or, or that they come across in the future. It then looks and creates a comparison guide between uh, the programs. So as a, as a decision maker for a school or a district, I can actually look at these programs side by side and figure out which one may make the most sense given the needs of, of my institution. And finally, that there's a way that the, all the research relative to these programs is in one aggregated place. I wanna talk a little bit about the process because the process so greatly informed the end product. Brain Futures brought together a really esteemed group of advisors. And these are people who are uh, accomplished scientists and educators as well as industry and nonprofit leaders. And this group really focused on trying to answer the question of uh, if we were to put a resource together for education decision makers, what would it need to do? So uh, what are the information uh, gaps that create obstacles for decision makers to be able to adopt these kinds of executive function programs. What can we do to remove those obstacles? And in the process, how do we offer a really rigorous uh, vetting uh, mechanism that creates an evidence-based standard for vetting programs in the future? Then the committee looked at, the advisory committee looked at how do we start to create a common language so that we know what we're talking about when we're looking at different programs. And as a decision maker, you can assess the kinds of categories of programs that are out there, and again, which ones may make the most amount of sense to your school. So first are the, the executive function specific trainings. And I'm gonna spend just a little bit of time on these because these are probably terms that um, some folks in the room might be less familiar with. So as an ex executive function specific training are tasks that develop those core mental processes that underlie all learning, um, as well as the more complex uh, executive function dependent thought processes. So cognitive training is non-subject related tasks uh, aimed at improving EF skills by targeting the areas in the brain that are, that are um, responsible for, uh, for these uh, skills. The, the uh, 
executive function curriculum is actually a pedagogical approach where teachers are trained in how to layer in executive function based activities into subject matter throughout the course of the day. And then subject specific comprehension such as uh, literacy training uh, also uses cognitive training uh, activities within the, within the, um, the implementation process. Mindfulness, we've heard a lot about. I was just mentioning uh, to someone earlier that from the time of the Kennedy report to um, this report, the amount of adoption that's happening on mindfulness programs across industries is really quite, quite extraordinary. And this is that moment by moment uh, awareness of thoughts, feelings, and senses, um, developing that witness consciousness that allows for greater amounts of uh, inhibitory control. Also neurofeedback, which uh, we have heard much more about um, in the news and this idea of being able to get feedback about the state of your mind and have that feedback encourage you to uh, change or maintain that state of mind for, for optimal learning. Social emotional learning obviously has, we're all uh, at this point probably very familiar with these kinds of programs. Um, and that brain literacy is this metacognitive approach, the idea of learning about uh, how your brain learns so that you can make uh, decisions about optimal learning environments. Part of making sense of all the different programs out there also means there needs to be a process for going from the wide mouth of the funnel down. Um, and part of that process for Brain Futures was the advisory committee looking and creating some uh, criteria uh, to allow us to begin, ulti or to ultimately begin to, uh, to apply a rubric. So this initial criteria used was, uh, can, <coughs> excuse me, can the implementation be used in at least one grade from K through 12? Can it be implemented in a classroom? Um, has it been used with a typically developing population as well as uh, not solely just for uh, populations with ADHD or learning disabilities? And the idea here is that if a school was to adopt a program, it could be adopted school-wide to the benefit of all students. And then, is there research available, uh, <coughs> excuse me, specific for this uh, intervention, not, not simply research for the, the category altogether? Then uh, we went to this inclusion threshold, like identifying what that rubric really is. Of the programs that, as we come down that wide mouth of the funnel, that met that, the, the, the criteria that I just mentioned, going a little bit deeper now and saying, okay, of these K through 12 classroom programs uh, that are used by students in a, all students in a class, which ones have one, at least one randomized control trial or a quasi-experimental study um, and with a sample size of at least 10? Uh, also, which ones have classroom-based implementations in at least one study, executive function outcomes in at least one study, and uh, developing student uh, populations in the sample size in at least one study. Of those, of the programs evaluated, 10 met those criteria. And for those 10, we then uh, put together the program guide, uh, the, prog the program guide section of the report. So for these 10 programs in the report, you're gonna see uh, this at a glance section, which is the purple box on the slide. And this is sort of the 50,000 foot view of a program, kind of the, the, the nuts and bolts of what you need to know as a decision maker. And then if that catches your attention, then there's the opportunity to go down a little bit deeper into the program descriptions. Each program des description follows a particular template where 30 plus program features were evaluated um, if, a, uh, if a program had those features and reported on. Then for the studies that helped a program meet the inclusion threshold talked about early, earlier, there's a summary of those studies in the program guide. And then uh, also programs might have other research that has been done on them that didn't necessarily aid in the uh, rubric, um, but were still important and uh, any reader would want to potentially know more. And obviously the opportunity for where to go to learn more about the program. I would be remiss if I also didn't mention that of, although there were 10 programs that we evaluated at this level, there were another 19 programs that were incredibly promising, and they are also included in the appendix, in the appendix of the report. So outcomes, right? This is what we, what we care about. Uh, th this list is the kind of list that you'd hope to see, right? This is your dream list. Increases in the percentage of students meeting proficiency levels, uh, state mandated tests. 
the um, allowing teachers more time to focus on teaching because there's fewer disruptive behaviors happening in the classroom and there's an increase in pro-social behaviors. That there is uh, statistically significant improvements on um, executive function tests recommended by the NIH and in their, in their toolkit for executive function, and as well as on school administ administered tests across uh, subjects. So what we know is that these kinds of programs affect the ecosystem of a classroom, the ecosystem of a school, of the internal ecosystem of, of students, and there are real objective performance markers. Within the report, the kinds of these kinds of gains are certainly highlighted for each of the programs, and you'll also see graphs like this one that pro provide really clear visuals of the type of impact these programs have. This is an example of a program featured in the report that focuses on EF-based learning strategies. And uh, the, this was, this, uh, these particular results are from students at a high poverty urban elementary school. And those students who went through this particular EF program training, 52% achieved mastery scores on state reading comprehension compared to just 21% of their schoolmates who did not go through the training. Similarly, those who went through the training received 19% uh, proficiency rates on math versus 7% of their, of their schoolmates, 12% proficiency in science versus just 8% of their schoolmates, and 39% efficiency in social science state tests versus 25%. So these are the kinds of results that we really can't afford to ignore, and th they're compelling. Oops. So, What's next? Brain Futures is really encour encouraging the nation to act. As Amy and Linda said, the Kennedy Forum report came out in 2015, and there is no need to wait around uh, for uh, whether there is a strong evidence base. There is. Uh, there is no need to wait around to see if um, how others are doing and implementing the program. There are plenty of examples. Uh, and we understand that information about scientifically validated uh, executive function specific programs has not been widely available to educators and to, uh, and to policymakers, but with this report we hope to change that. Among the 10 highlighted programs in this report, their adoption over the last four years has grown by 40%, affecting 7,200 schools. And as amazing and wonderful as that is, there's still a lot of room to grow. Kennedy for, uh, the the uh, Brain Futures uh, report, building on the Kennedy Forum report, is creating the platform that encourages uh, Congress and the U.S. Department of Education to launch initiatives to stimulate adoption of effective EF programs. Also for state legislators and, Depart and State Department of Eds to do similar uh, activities to, um, to encourage the uptake of these programs. For local school systems to really think about the adoption either school-wide or ideally district-wide. And finally, for schools of education to think about uh, layering and executive function training as a core component of new teacher training as well as continuing education so that all teachers understand what executive function is and how it impacts children. We're confident that uh, from the data that we have that executive function programs absolutely change the lives of students. There is anecdotal uh, and empirical data that points to that. And we believe that it's not only the students in the schools that grow stronger from these implementations, but also our nation. Thank you. Thanks, Holly. Well, I hope everybody out there is super excited. I know I've spent my career in mental health and we often are talking about unsolvable problems, doom and gloom, and here's something exciting. We have something that works that could help so many kids. So I hope you all are getting jazzed up and ready to join us in this fight so that in a couple years, Amy can come back and say, we're doing it, it's happening. But anyway, before we go there, I want to introduce our panel. We've got a diverse group with us today, and we're so excited that Sarah Sparks a reporter and assistant editor for Education Week is here to moderate the conversation. Sarah has covered education research and the science of learning for more than 15 years. 
I'm sure many of you have read her work and know she is passionate about improving education for all students. Please join me in welcoming Sarah. Thanks. Um, we've got a great group with us today from all levels of education, and I think they'll have a lot of good advice for you guys, as well as some things to think about as you are exploring executive function. Um, with me is uh, Robert Kravitz, superintendent of Englewood Public Schools in New Jersey. Um, he's about eight miles from Manhattan and maybe a world away and has been uh, implementing district-wide evidence-based executive function and having really amazing results with that. Uh, next to him is Scott Palmer, managing partner and co-founder of Education Council, which is an education organization that works with nonprofits, foundations, policymakers to advance systemic changes for school improvement. Next to him is Beryl Dudney, a pre-K teacher at Commodore John Rogers Elementary Middle School, a Title I school in Baltimore, where she also is an instructional coach and curriculum and program lead for executive function skills curriculum. And next to me is Rosalind Rice Harris, uh, the program director of school improvement at the Council of Chief State School Officers, where she has been doing a lot of executive function work with uh, states and districts. Very happy you could all join us. I'd like to start with Robert. Um, you saw some of those um, results in the PowerPoint about what schools can see from their students in terms of improvement in using some of these executive function programs. What have you found in your own district and how have you been implementing it? So we implemented, uh, thanks to LG as a sponsor, a corporate sponsor of our entire program, we were able to implement it with all our 3,200 students. Uh, where we've seen the, the greatest effect is in our younger students, which is the most important. We have pre-K students on a daily basis, our kindergarten students who are practicing through Inner Explorer, our program that we chose, uh, a reduction of classroom disruptions. We've seen academic growth uh, in our reading skills just by taking that 15, 20 minute break every morning. Uh, and, and really seeing a phenomenal uh, change in atmosphere in our school. And one a little joke that we had is a newly elected mayor was asked to, he said, can I s visit the school? And I said, sure, anytime you want, just stop in. And he called me from the school and he said, what's going on? I walked into a room, there's 400 kids meditating. What are you doing here? <laughs> I said, that's, that's our mindfulness. He said, I don't know what that means. I said, well, you'll see, you'll see, just participate. And he was sitting crisscross with the applesauce with the kids as they were meditating. And, um, we were fortunate enough, again, to, to enroll roll it through, out through our entire district through professional development, constant follow-up. Each school principal presents a plan to me, an action plan, uh, at the beginning of September of how they're going to do it. We've had in our high school a mindfulness room where students are having a tough day can go in there. We've had a teacher who was also trained in yoga, so she works with the, the students. We really wanted to bring about uh, the break. They need a break. As a father of three children, I constantly tell my children, take a break take a break, it's not so bad, let's just breathe together. And as a practitioner of Tai Chi and, and Qigong, I understand that it's, it's important in our life. 
And how long did it take to get that fully integrated in your district? Well, I mandated it. So, <laughs> uh, so it became even for the mayor. Which yeah. is really. <laughs> so you know, we we are rolling it out. Is there full acceptance? Not yet. There's some people who don't believe in it, and we recognize that. But it's it's mandated, and we tell them that they have to do it. It has to be part of it, and that's we're seeing the results academically. The reduction in, as I said, student behavior reports that we're receiving in grades pre-K through five now have reduced significantly. Uh, over a 15% reduction in all of that and increase in test scores. Over 6% every year of the two years that we've been doing it. So we're very proud of that. And did the mayor come on board and have you he seen? He tweeted, what, uh, <laughs> mindfulness is taking place in our schools and I didn't know anything about it. So that's a good thing, I guess. <laughs> of course, no board members have called me yet on that, so I'm happy. Uh, but he, he was just impressed because again, that. While it's innovative, it's really not. It's really just taking the time to breathe with your children. And that's something we miss a lot. Rosalind, what sort of supports have you seen among the states? And what interest have you seen among the states in putting out these kind of programs? So that's a really great question. The states that we, we've been working with, uh, as you know, with ESSA, there's been uh, mandates to put together a statewide MTSS framework, so multi-tiered systems of support. And states are looking to expand their intervention base to include executive functioning work, skills, strategies, programs uh, to support the whole child so that we're able, the states are able to elevate that work from just supporting a small subset of the student population namely our students with disabilities, to supporting all kids and being able to create a cohesive and comprehensive system that provides early intervention, early supports in order to lessen that number of students that are referred to special education, as well as to increase outcomes for kids. So it's really gaining traction. Uh, we especially see it in the social emotional learning work uh, that states are doing, as well as with their personalized learning work that states are embarking on as well. There are more evidence requirements in ESSA. What sort of challenges have you seen states having with that part, and how are they trying to cope with that? <laughs> that is a good question as well. Uh, with the evidence-based mandate around uh, interventions and strategies, uh, states have been very creative in uh, putting together strategies that align and support the tiers of intervention that are required through ESSA in order to do what's right for kids and change outcomes. And states have been very innovative in partnering with uh, universities, resource, uh, research institutions, uh, as well as other intermediaries to collect the data and curate this information in order to support the evidence tiers and use these strategies uh, because they have the anecdotal and data evidence within the districts. So it's, it's about curating it and putting that information together to support the tiers in order to further validate the work that they're doing. Do you have any examples of a state that's being really creative on it? Hmm. I think it, uh, going back to uh, what our dear superintendent shared, it's, it's everyone's doing something innovative, but it's not new. So mm -hmm. for example, New York has, is using community schools, that concept, in order to provide social emotional learning support, uh, systemic reform uh, with their teachers, students, as well as the community in order to fully support the whole child in their development to increase student outcomes. And that strategy has been so critical in their transformation of their lowest performing schools, it's now part of their school reform model across the state. Uh, in addition, we also have two states that are doing really great work with their multi-tiered system of support frameworks, and those states are Michigan and Kansas that are actually utilizing these strategies within their tiers of support. 
uh, in order to not just support, again, their uh, students with disabilities, but to support all students in starting that work early so they were able to, at a, er, at a faster rate, expand their intervention resources to their districts in order to support them in the choices they're making uh, to move student achievement. And they've also <coughs> seen maybe within the, maybe about 15 years ago, that there is a need to support students around readiness. So the, the term executive function uh, functioning wasn't used necessarily, but supporting students around school readiness and coping skills and self-regulation. So all of those, uh, the components and the competencies of social emotional learning, those were the skills that have been called out and these types of programs, curricula, and training have been put together within their frameworks to support students in the uh, positive development of those skills. Beryl, the school readiness is your cup of tea. How are you <clears throat> implementing this with your kids? And how did you get into it? So I um, am going to my seventh year in the classroom as an early childhood educator. I started as a Baltimore City 2013 core member. Um, and I'm honored to still be a didactic peer of my little learner leaders, um, but I'm also functioning as an instructional coach and program lead. Um, and in this capacity, I'm able to on the ground see what implementation looks like, but then also support it at a larger level. We're in our third year in Baltimore City. I teach in the 100% Network, which is a network of turnaround schools led by my principal, Mark Martin. Um, and so we're in our third year of implementing Tools of the Mind, which is one of the programs highlighted in this report. Um, and what Tools of the Mind has really done for us and what it did for me is completely transform what early childhood education looks like by putting EF work at the forefront of everything that we do. So I think what really sets apart our work and what, what sets apart Tools is that, one, it completely sort of flips how teachers think about teaching and learning, and that's huge, right? We can't really change practice at a national level or at a classroom level if we don't change perspective. So what Tools does at the very beginning is it brings theory, Vygotskyan theory, and cutting edge neuro, um, neuro, excuse me, neuroscience research uh, into the why. So teachers buy into the why, administrators buy into the why, district level leadership buy, buys into the why, and then that theory also changes our practice. Um, so, at the same time, um, it is really innovative because there is ongoing professional development and support, which is really important around supporting practice, right? You can change a teacher's perspective, but it doesn't mean a whole lot if that practice isn't supported. Um, and then what also I think sets it apart is that we've found that the executive, the development of executive function is supported by um, embedding um, in every single activity and in every part of our teacher's school day executive function self-regulation components. So that's been really huge for us. And what we're seeing um, is just really exciting observational data and then we're also sort of creating a broader narrative of how this work um, works on the ground in Baltimore. Just to get back to sort of what got me into it between my first and my second year, I didn't answer that question, sorry. Um, I saw in DC Tools of the Mind uh, at a Kip, at Kip Grow Academy here in DC. So I saw it being implemented with really high fidelity and a level of efficacy that was just completely inspiring. In my head, as an educator, I knew sort of what early childhood education should look like, um, but then tools broaden that perspective of what it should look like for me because I didn't fully understand executive functioning. Um, and then it also showed me what it could look like, and then it empowered me to actually make that happen in my classroom. And that's like the most exciting thing in the world is bringing it to our kids in Baltimore. And my goal is to sort of bring it to as many classrooms on the national level as possible. Could you give an example of a, a classroom practice that would look different um, if you don't really know about the executive function versus when you do and you've been trained? Yeah, we spoke a little of this earlier when we were um, talking about Right, there's this way in which we're very consumed around rigor and readiness. Um, but if you don't sort of come from a background of understanding how the brain works, then you think rigor looks a specific way, right? So I'm not gonna have my children tracing sight words and sitting on the carpet for an hour crisscross applesauce like a robot, right? It's not developmentally appropriate. That's not education, it's the practice of freedom to use Bell Hooks's words. But there are lots of things that, so if you come into our classroom that might feel a little hokey or feel a little frilly, but are actually really intentional. So for example, We'll do a lot of finger plays to build their phonemic awareness, to engage them in a developmentally appropriate way. We'll build their working memory with activities like I would say, okay, friends, take your hands, go head, head, shoulders, you do it, head, head, shoulders, things like that that help them actually remember 
a, a quantity of objects and remember a perspective, remember an idea. Um, so there are lots of little things, but then the specific academic activities in the curriculum are also all built around developing self-regulation. So we use external mediators and all of that stuff that you guys already know because you understand <laughs> the brain probably far more than I do. That's great. Robert, how, how much training did you find teachers needed to kind of get into the swing of things? So we, we had the original training and we've done follow-up trainings, but really, again, it's, it's them driving it, what they want to do. We're seeing the most growth with the teachers who are in, in, embracing it. Um, younger teachers, and I mean that for younger grade levels, are more uh, alive with it. They're, they're taking advantage of this. The high school obviously is a different perspective. They're, they're mm -hmm. thinking about you know, how am I going to get my students to pass. So that's the, the mind shift we're working with. Our hardest has been middle school, but the pre-K, the K, grades K, pre-K to five have really embraced it and looked at it as the break, the, the brain break and using a lot of creative curriculum the same way where everything is just, it's free in the classroom to learn. Uh, but when, when it's teacher driven, when teachers are taking ownership of it, they're making the decision of how they're gonna bring it into their classroom, that's when we see the most success, so. And are they all doing something cohesive or are they getting autonomy to do their own curriculum? So in our, so three, three different versions in a pre-KK, as I said, they, when the all the students arrive in the morning. The principal does her morning announcements and that's when they put on the video and they'll all be breathing and meditating for the first few minutes of the day. Uh, then they'll follow up throughout the day, the pre-K and K teachers. The first through, first through second grade uh, building will have the principal again go on the loudspeaker and announce it's time for shark fin. And everybody please sit up and breathe in. It's, it's interesting, we have 500 students in that building and you can hear a pin drop for the 10 minutes that they're all meditating and you hear the video going on. Uh, the three through five do it in the classroom. Some start the day, some do it after lunch. The traditional model of, okay, you've just come back from lunch and you're ready to run around, put your head down on the, on the desk and shut the lights. Well, instead they're showing a video and teaching kids to sit up and just start breathing with them. Uh, so that's how they've really developed their own techniques in the, in, the, in the use of the product. Scott, there's been tremendous increase in interest in executive function, social emotional learning. Mm -hmm. And I can't think of a district that isn't at least interested or trying something. What cautions should they uh, have when starting to explore this sort of thing? Well, first, if you don't mind, take it in two parts. I just want to start by saying uh, congratulations to Linden Brain Futures. I think this is uh, really important work. And I, I think um, my role here, besides thinking nationally and how do we spread and how do we understand you know, the, the implications, positive and, and cautions, is also uh, work we're doing with a growing group of entities around how do we elevate the science of learning and development as itself a driver of big change in education because the findings are so profound, the crystallizing of understanding is so profound, notwithstanding its long history as well. Uh, and it is so uh, uh, unrepresented fundamentally in our education systems that um, that's both a, a horrible recognition and an opportunity that if we could close the gap, we could have profound effect. And that goes for what, uh, Bruce, your, your, your brain imaging and others tells us about uh, human potential, about malleability, about individuality, uh, about the power of context, and, and um, all these things that could have profound effect. And, and certainly a, a, among the more important of them are both uh, the understandings of how Real learning is at the integration of social, emotional, and academic, and the way that integration affects very much the architecture of brain integration, and the role of executive function as a critical foundational component of that. So um, I think there's so much here that's, you know, to use the science to then take on an issue like that, again, as others have said, to then look at what, what specifically can you do? What specific actions do we know that are implementable, that are knowable, that are being used and implemented? It's, it's really, uh, important and just as a policy wonk and lawyer for a minute who used to work at the federal level, to tie it to SS evidence standards is also really uh, smart, right? And I think there's a good timeline for that. I, I guess that said, you know, the, the caution I think is uh, not so much, I think something everyone would agree with, right, is that uh, even as we move on these programs, and I think the idea of early actions and movement much more important than non-movement, so let's be very clear about that, I think it will be good to keep in mind uh, how do we understand not just what works, but what works in what context for what kids with what reasoned adaptations? So my guess is 
um, if we could even better really build an infrastructure and an architecture around this work to learn more, learn faster, I think that would be great. I think about the other 19 promising that you had, right? My guess is we want to learn more to, to figure out what would uh, work best. Uh, and the other is just to make sure that uh, people see the power of the early implementable actions but don't think that therefore if you just implement a single program you've done everything you need to do for the rest of schooling or the rest of time to try to strengthen whether executive function or SEL or align systems with the science of learning and development. Those are huge structural and cultural shifts. So not so much a caution as just to make sure people understand rightly what this, the power of this great work and how it fits in the broader uh, context. Um, and uh, I think you know, if, we, if we do, I really can see a number of ways maybe we'll get to about how this work could spread uh, and then how it could also help do what I think a lot of people spoke about, Beryl, you and others, which is in some ways the most important thing, which is shift mindsets, mm -hmm. right, about uh, what school is really trying to achieve and what works. I think about, you know, I, I, we were all shaking our heads numbers, we got it, we got to get to middle school and high school, right, because uh, if you really wanted to improve all the outcomes you said, you would implement this work uh, as, as excited as you would if you thought about the, not you, sir, but you know, no, the, no, no, I the, the, your, your team. And it's not surprising, as we like to say in policy, you can mandate implementation. It's very hard to mandate good implementation, right? Mm. So you've got to work with the mindset shifts. But if we can shift those mindsets, I think you'll get a lot of uptake. Sorry for the long answer. Well, a follow-up on that, actually, Robert, if you could talk a little bit more about uh, the developmental differences and what you've found over the past couple of years of things that seem to work very well for the little ones that don't work so well as well, they get older or vice versa. So along the same lines, it's, it's you know, as an educator and as a, a school leader, one of the things I always say to parents, which is the hardest thing to explain, is time. We need time. Uh, high school senior doesn't want time. They want to know what their SAT scores will be and where they're going next year. And then the same thing with middle school, where they're going to go to high school. So that's the hardest part for all of us, as we say, if we start with the younger students, that's where the future will come from. When we get them reading at a younger age in Englewood, we've created literacy apps that will help them and we've seen the growth. But as parents constantly hound me and say, what about the seventh grade scores? And I'll say, but first grade is reading well above level now because we spent four years with them. They don't care. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I don't mean it that they don't care, but they don't understand that it is a time uh, education takes time and that change and the buy-in from the middle school and high school teachers for them it's a culture shift right because the, mm -hmm. the demands of a parent asking that question I don't care about mindfulness I care about the score because my student my child has to go to that and that's that's a tough thing for a teacher to deal with um, so it's that's a hard one that is a real hard one that mind shift and and explaining to them and you can explain it to a percentage of parents but how many really want to get it and that's the problem. So we, you know, unfortunately, that's where we start, the younger. Mm -hmm. So as they come through our system, they are, we're seeing the results. And that's what I live for. for as every, <coughs> every month when I do my presentation to my Board of Education, to the public, explaining, here's the growth, here's the growth. Five years from now, you will see the benefits of this program because we're seeing it in our younger students. Uh, but that's a whole culture shift for a district. Roslyn, it seems like that would be a big culture shift for accountability as well. Mm -hmm. And I know <laughs> states are trying to figure out how to incorporate that, but can you talk a little bit about how you balance and integrate some of these things that take a lot longer to show uh, accountability-related measures? Mm -hmm. so, so funny, Sarah. I was just thinking as Robert was talking, it, it's about balance, especially going into the secondary, going into secondary level, being a former principal myself, it was always thinking about, well, yes, I want my kids to be better citizens and leading a persistently low performing school, I have three years to get out of trouble. So, <laughs> you know, which, which comes first, the chicken or the egg? And uh, it's really about finding that balance and that high level of uh, implementation and fidelity of implementation that is integrated then throughout the day so that that academic piece is not lost, that content piece is not lost, uh, but that comes with not just the buy-in, but the belief that these practices are not just changing you, but changing your, your students as well so that you will all see the benefit day in, day out, and then the long-term benefit as well. And I think also, uh, 
teachers, districts, uh, parents also are concerned around sustainability that yes I'm doing this really well really hard for like these three months six months to a year mm -hmm. so what happens next year if I have someone that may not believe as much or mm -hmm. may not practice as much what are going to be those lasting effects so it's it's about figuring all of those uh, working those kinks out in order to ensure that 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 high impact uh, will remain and sustain throughout uh, the child's uh, K-12 career and then going to that piece around accountability, uh, I think that is the one of the, the beauty around ESSA is that uh, with states developing their accountability systems and understanding that change takes time, I think the flexibility that we have within ESSA mm -hmm. allows for for that, that, that time um, and we're able to then add within our accountability, uh, the, within the system, models in which to monitor that growth. So if we're looking at discipline, we're looking at the re reduction of suspensions, uh, we're looking at the increase of students uh, um, being able, of uh, student <laughs> attendance as well as enrolling in to uh, AP classes, things like that. All these different measures that go into that additional measure around uh, school climate, culture, uh, student supports can be then identified using this data. And that takes time to generate, but the great thing is that we have the time to generate it because these measures are new. Um, Beryl, when you're working with other teachers, what are you showing them about how to measure their own progress and their, their kids' progress, and how to integrate um, the academic responsibilities that they have and classroom management responsibilities with this sort of broader growth as a person. I think what's so exciting for me about Tools of the Mind is that there isn't really differentiation between any of those things. So it's an all-encompassing curriculum where self-regulation is embedded to academic activities and as a result, right. right, there really isn't a need for behavior management. So when I say it's transformative, I mean it, right? I walk into classrooms and like my teachers are happy. They could be in the classroom the rest of your lives. And if you have been in a public, like a pub public Title I school, like you know that's not the case, <laughs> right? That's huge. Kids love learning and generally you see that in early childhood classrooms, but you see it in a way that I've never seen it before. Kids are really engaged. Kids are um, regulating themselves, peer regulating, other re regulating, all these things. So I don't think, I think that, I think the big, how you help teachers um, implement and understand that data and track it and buy in is just by really grounding everything that you do in that why. It's like any successful organization. You have to have that mission. You have to have that why. Um, and so whether it's in professional development sessions, getting back to the theories, getting back to the why, or grounding coaching conversations, and this is what we're doing, and here's how your practice did that. I think that's really how you connect, um, connect the dots. But what's really exciting is that Teachers are, feel free and empowered to do great work for their kids, right? Because they've had this idea of what they want to get their students, but they never actually had the tools to help develop their kids and, and, and increase that growth in the way that they want to. So as a teacher, it's sort of like it hits you in the face. At first, you're like, whoa, this is so different. This is a lot. But then you start to practice, and you can't help you can't, like you have to buy in because you see what it does for your kids. So it's about that initial why, and then it's sort of trickles from there very quickly. So I'm a research reporter, and I was getting a little down memory lane when Bruce was talking about the research because it's been growing so rapidly, and there have been such interesting implications for what we've been finding. Um, the downside of that is we also had a very early rush to do Okay, so we will brain train, and in 30 minutes, we will be able to change kids' lives forever. And as that rolled out, uh, there was some promising early research. Some of that went a little overboard. We had uh, the Federal Trade Commission a couple years ago, uh, I believe had a $50 million settlement against Lumos Labs, which does uh, Lumosity and a few others that uh, they were getting a little ahead of their science. Um, and so I have a question for all of the panel, and maybe for Bruce too, if you'd if you be willing. 
what questions do you still want answered? What areas do you still think we need to learn more about to get that effective programs for <laughs> students in a variety of different uh, environments? And any one of you could start, depending on who wants to. I feel like I, I know the program that I want to use the rest of my life, which I know I'm still open to learning and open to other things, and I have a growth mindset. Yes, good. Um, but I, very much so. But I think for, for me, the, the missing link, link is how do we really harness our power and energy around um, effective implementation science, right? Because mm -hmm. we have the stuff that works. We have the knowledge, but there's a problem of buy-in with people in power. And it's not, that they, it's not their fault, right? But the pendulum is swinging. How do we bring that pendulum to the middle and ground ourselves in that why? So for me, it's really less about questions of the actual stuff and questions of how we get people to believe in this stuff. And so for me, and that work starts first and foremost with my kids on the carpet, and then it translates into teachers and then conversations at the district level. And so that's what's so exciting about this and about this report for me is we have this info. How do we get it into the hands of the right people, and how do we tell this story in a way that they buy into it? If I can build mm -hmm. on that, and by the way, we're all going to have a site visit to Barrel's class. If you want to <laughs> sign up, there's a sheet in the back. We're going to have a great, I'd love it. Um, but I think. Uh, you know, I, I think we can think about hold these things as truths at the same time, right? One is that uh, there's unbelievable power in the in the science of learning and development that is vastly underutilized in our system, and there are some evidence-based and thankfully curated them things that um, we can and should be doing. Um, at the same time, there's uh, always great need for much more R and D again around what works in what context for what kids in what dosage, you know, et cetera. But also about what else works and, what, and how does it fit systemically. And um, so uh, one of the things that's really hard is we have a very, I'll use a positive term, complex uh, education ecosystem, right? Mm -hmm. uh, various layers of players, various entry points, unclear authority, deeply human system. It's very hard to spread something with you know, fidelity or reason adaptation in a way that gets down to that culture shift where it's just, it's just the way we do our work. But, there are also myriad entry points, I think, for work like this to spread it. And one of the other things I'll say is, and you know this, Sarah, that we, among other things in this system, have a very weak R&D infrastructure, right? There's just very little spent or done to try to really make education systems function like a learning system, which is why pieces like this that bring some of that in, in bite-sized digestible chunks is important. But uh, we've got to strengthen all that. And I don't think that is a reason not to move in these directions, I think, to your point. It's a reason to be aware that you could over or underreach, mm -hmm. and we need to attend to that continuous improvement. Um, but uh, but hopefully we can do both of those simultaneously. So I guess just my question of uh, every day I, I ask the why in everything we do, and I never I never stop asking. And as a teacher, um, I ask my students to always question the why, and I don't want them to answer. I want them to think, and then come back to the next class wondering why. So I don't have an answer as to your question of what, what do I want to know next? Because if I knew, I wouldn't ask the why. <laughs> so that's why I, I live for education, to ask that why every day. And in my office, I have four walls, and each wall has a, a poster that says, ask the why. And I tell every parent, and every student, and every teacher, and every administrator I deal with to ask the why. Why are we doing this? Why do we do this? Why is that? Why is that? If we didn't ask that question, I don't know what job we, we would be in. So I don't have an answer as what do I want to learn because I learn every day. I think for me it would be a, a question still around uh, long-term impact and sustainability. Uh, just knowing the variability that happens within classrooms, schools, and just development of a child throughout their school career. How long do these effects have a hold and a positive impact on a child uh, going through the system? Any thoughts, please? I was asked to come up anyway for Q&A. <laughs> well, you don't have a chair, Bruce. Uh, well, it is a multi-tiered system and a complex ecosystem, like you said, and we need a multi-tier. Uh, every tier needs answers. Certainly, the long run, uh, long-term effects have to be learned, and then that interacts with questions of dose and maintenance of training. Uh, that's a complex research effort but certainly one that can be done. So then the question becomes, where do you get the resources to do it? We work with some schools, what we call innovation partners, where 
uh, we work out the ability to get access to the identified individual child data because you need that level of data then to we can merge with our data we collect we have 350 million data points ourselves now in this because we can collect so much information while kids are actually doing the computer programs and committed to continually use that data to improve. So that's the other thing. Is if I, I know what in our particular programs, I worked on, the, on maybe for 20 years, but the first program uh, generation is not going to be the, the final story or the best. That's why we collect all the data. So if, we're not have, if we don't have better interventions, five years from now than we have now, oh, we've failed. Cool. So we have, we need these partnerships, I think, and kidding. the resources in order to get that level of individual child data anonymized so that we can really uh, look at that. Then commitments from administration for taking a multi-year risk mm -hmm. and not expect that they're gonna make a decision after just one, one year of implementation. Um, so many questions that are exciting to, to keep learning. And then how do these different things interact? I mean, listening to the success that the two of you have had, I'm not surprised with Tools of the Mind and the early children and how it, cha it transforms things. And then the meditation for setting a certain neural background state and helping self-regulation and stuff. But then what if you build on top of that the type of intensive focused cognitive stimulation of specific neural systems that we're developing. So it's those sort of integrated research questions that are, and then implementation science is the key um, mm -hmm. because, uh, uh, yeah, it, to change uh, perspectives and then provide the ongoing support afterwards for teachers once they've changed the perspective, how to do that how to do it effectively, cost effectively, to engage adult learners, adult learners of, of a, a, a very highly variable population of adult learners when you look at the school uh, teachers across the country. It's a, a big challenge for that. We would have loved to have more top-down support from the Department of Education, I might say, uh, to be able to, because to be able to address those sort of questions can be done with, um, but it takes a level of research grant support that has been on the papers, but I mean, it has potentially programs in DOE, but does not seem to have been developed and deployed as widely and effectively as possible to support the gaining of the new knowledge we need. To keep you from going and sitting down again, I think we'll open it up for questions from the audience. Uh, just please raise your hand and wait until the uh, microphone gets to you so that we can actually hear you. Hi, uh, Sunil Iyengar, Director of Research at the National Endowment for the Arts. Um, thank you. The report is really a great uh, example of something that can motivate, I think, funders to think about incentivizing research, for example, in this space. Uh, in a thoughtful way. Um, I had a question. Um, to what extent do any of you see, either in practice or in terms of potential, um, the arts being used as a delivery mechanism for some of these kinds of interventions? And being mindful, of course, of fidelity issues and effect efficacy of programs that are already established, but maybe sort of as entry points or looking at the new frontier. Do you see this happening? Is this something we could do? And, you know, I'm even wondering if to some extent, some of these interventions can be a conduit to creativity. <coughs> Beryl, do you use arts? In yeah, so our arts integration is very much a part of everything that we do, and I think what's so fantastic about it, right, is you can really, if you're doing it right, apply it to every curriculum and every classroom. Um, what's so fantastic about a lot of EF programs and what I really like about Tools of the Mind is that you have these basic structures that you come to understand as really transformational for your kids and you can implement them. So you have these things that you rely on, these things you know that are happening, but then you have this great freedom that you can have with you and your kids to theme what you're doing around, you know, creating a doctor's offices, creating camping camping sites and dissenters, and they're mm -hmm. making role props. And I am singing and chanting all the time. So if you come to my classroom, get ready for that, because we are, <laughs> it is a performance together. Um, but it's in everything that we do. And so I think when we look at these programs, it's really important to ensure that teachers can do something with high levels of fidelity, but then also have the autonomy to have it serve their kids. So I'll answer from New Jersey's perspective. This is the first year New Jersey has mandated 
for every grade six through 12 to have an offering of dance and theater arts. So as we're looking at that, because that's a cost to our district, looking to figure out how we can bring that in, <coughs> make use of that time, right? So in, in addition to dance instruction, and theater arts instruction, adding a wellness component, uh, because you have a limited amount of time every day. And if that's, if we are bringing in wellness into our, or mindfulness into our programs, and then here's a mandated program that can match, that's something we're looking at. Is we that all grades? Um, so K through five, it's mandated to start to introduce. Six through 12, it's mandated to have a dance, a certified dance instructor and a theater arts instructor on staff in each of your buildings. We have a physical exercise program that goes along with our computer exercises that, where the physical exercises are designed to have cognitive components so that they actually activate the same brain systems as the computer exercises do, but in the context of whole body activity and social interaction. And part of that is dance. So dance has a great opportunity, if you adopt the perspective, to be a training place for executive function skills. And so I'd be happy to talk to you about you how that yeah. dan your dance curriculum could be shaped in that way. Yeah. Let's try to get Hi, I'm Karen Howard with Mental Health America. We're a nonprofit organization. And I have like four or five questions, but I'll <laughs> limit it to one or two one. for you all. Um, I, I wanted to, so I work in federal advocacy. Uh, so from the perspective of um, some of the ESSA, school safety, and other um, issues that are being discussed. I wanted to know what kind of help would um, you seek from policymakers at this time? ESSA will, will be looked at for sure this year. Um, and the second question is, how um, do you engage parents? Mm -hmm. uh, because there are parenting models that I've seen to help parents be, to help train parenting. Um, skills and um, if you guys use those or other methods. And I'll maybe let you start. So we know of, uh, so for example, Wisconsin uh, actually addresses social emotional learning uh, through their school safety uh, and climate component within their statewide strategy. So there is curricula, professional development, there's also parent resources to support this work uh, that have been developed by the state have, that has been deployed maybe for over the past year and a half. So states are looking at uh, EF and social emotional learning through that lens. There, there, it's a variety of lenses in which a social emotional learning is being uh, prioritized uh, through school improvement, through school safety, uh, through uh, culture and climate. Uh, it, it's a very exciting and dynamic time uh, for the use of cell uh, within our uh, changing school structure. So we're really excited about seeing that work. Uh, and what I think that uh, where policymakers can weigh in, uh, at least with the SEA, is definitely around uh, the support is funding. Uh, it's it's about uh, the money and understanding of. Uh, the need for this communal support of our children. If we're really believing in whole child development, it's, it's not cheap, but funding needs to be strategic. Uh, and not just more funding, but a flexibility in braiding funds in order to support these efforts within schools. Those are places where our policymakers can lean in. So for example, in Georgia, uh, they have created these safe centers throughout the country, throughout the, I'm sorry, throughout the state. And the majority of their districts are rural. So these safe centers don't just support their students, but the community as well. And it's through that intentional connection between community organizations, the SEA, and the state government across agencies, that is where they're getting the bang for their buck around uh, uh, intentional services for that community to uh, mostly impact student outcomes, but, but to better the community and to build these partnerships that are essential for really strong development of kids. So being intentional around working across the agency, uh, eliminating those barriers to do so, and also funding, I think, would be a great place for policymakers to lean in. Mm -hmm. 
And Scott, I think yeah, I would agree. And, and I think, obviously, there's a lot of, of complications at the federal level right now, as you know. But I think there are uh, funding sources that could be better understood, blended, braided around mm -hmm. um, school improvement, as was said, around uh, school discipline and, and safety. There certainly could be more strategic investment, even that would probably have bipartisan support if we could figure out the budget side, including, again, around significantly increasing funding on the R&D infrastructure and other mm -hmm. things that would provide um, some important base. And, and then there are risks, too, as there always are, right? So um, we're very mindful that there not be uh, harm done that um, limits access to critical data for mm -hmm. research into programs like this that I would be on the watch for and other things. So I think always you got to look at the and think about how the policy environment can sometimes require, but also incent and fund and remove barriers and other things that um, that policy uh, can do. Um, and I think now is an interesting moment because we're at something of an inflection point about even what is the frame and what are the drivers. And states are particularly, I think, central to defining what matters most, why SEL and others arriving and, and arising sort of at this moment is, is important. And I say that just because I think one thing that I'd encourage brain futures to do is think about how it shifts mindsets and empowers mindsets, not only at the level of teaching and learning, which is most critical, uh, but also at the leaning of, uh, le level of policymakers, right? So um, we can start with your mayor, but one way or the other, uh, making sure that people understand that there's something here that's uh, impactful, actionable, has evidence, is affordable, right? These are things that policymakers will want to hear if they hear it rightly. So I'll speak to New Jersey. New Jersey uh, has just gone through a preschool expansion grant for a lot of schools. That's we were fortunate example. that yeah. we were allowed to do that in Englewood. <laughs> and part of that uh, component is to work with a community-based organization. So you have curriculum that's based with SEL embedded in all day long and working with outside uh, community-based organizations that are housing some of our pre-K students. So they're actually in the community and they're so part of our students are at a, a outside agency. Some of our students are with us. And working together, we offer professional development together, so we are truly embedded in our community, helping students, again, back at that young age, and working with families, doing professional development for families, both at the community event, community partnership organization, and in our school. So it's truly a town-wide uh, event to help students, parents, and everyone in the community. And it's a great example, because there's another round of funding coming yep. soon. So just a good example. And just, do we have enough time for a few more? <laughs> uh, hello, I'm Sis Wenger. I'm with the National Association for Children of Addiction, which is about 25% of every classroom in this country. And I'm thinking about those children because the lid's on the bottle mm -hmm. with them. And, and unless we get that lid off, much of what I'm hearing today, will, it will do good, but it could do so much better. And, and so what has troubled me in recent years is what happened in the Department of Ed when they canceled the state portion of the drug-free schools money. That money had morphed into, in most school systems to being the money that supported student assistance programs. And when you had student assistance programs, you had kids coming into group during school time with kids who have the same kind of problems, and it would be all kinds of problems. Mostly they're for children in trouble or who are troubled by what's going on at home. And so you have the, the all-A student who's just killing himself to be perfect and isn't quite so noticeable as being troubled, who is trying to make sure no one finds out how bad it is at home. And all day long he makes his decisions based on that paradigm. Or you have the kid whose mom was drunk when he left and the baby was in the crib and, and came to school late. And so you have all these you know, various levels of internal stress that could benefit so tremendously from these programs who, first of all, need to have their brain calm down with the social and emotional stressors that are all day, all night in their family situation. And student assistance programs started to die when that money changed. When they were first created, school systems found the money themselves because it worked so well. So I think, I, I just love what you, I'm gonna take that book and, and tie it into every student assistance thing I run into, uh, but I think we need to say, well, how do we uncork the bottle with whatever program you're putting into place so that it can work faster and better? We have talked a lot about this in general. 
but do any of you have any thoughts on uh, the interventions and supports necessary for students who have significant executive function deficits, uh, those who have a history of trauma or a history of uh, drug exposure or anything of that sort? I, for me, in the classroom and then in helping other educators, Tools of the Mind gave me not only the theory and sort of the vernacular to explain what I was seeing, but it gave me a really broad set of skills. And I think my takeaway, right, is that um, in the same way that we want our kids in third grade to learn math in a constructivist space, we need them to learn self-regulation in a constructivist space. And it's about giving them the proper scaffold so they can learn self-regulation. And so what Tools does is it helps teachers understand instructional interactions a lot differently so that every kid is getting the support that they need within their zone of proximal development around self-regulation. So it's really about how do we build programs that help educators serve every kid. And I have found that in tools, I'm able to really enrich um, the levels of self-regulation, the development of self-regulation in my students who have come, come into my classroom with higher levels of it. But then my kids who are coming in, it with, coming in with a lot less, like it is so impactful what tools is able to do with them. But I'm using the same understanding and I'm using many of the same activities. I'm just changing my instructional approach within those activities. Yeah, so <clears throat> executive function development is compromised by many things. So one of them is certainly related to the stress uh, in the household that you describe and then all the other limitations of more positive interactions between the parents and the child when that is the situation at home. Uh, but And unfortunately, children from poverty get multiple of these at the same time. So it's not just that they get this part or that part. So our program and others like ours are aimed specifically at that developmental delay because that's where it's, these forces come together and compromise that critical function. And they're, they're one of the great things, of course, about the Brain Futures Report is that it has actually reviewed the evidence, which helps address the issue you raised about too high expectations mm -hmm. some generations or uh, some years ago, maybe a decade ago, and false claims. And the idea that brain training or cognitive training is dismissed categorically because it doesn't work because of things like this. And the obvious answer is some brain training works and some doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Just like some pills work and some pills don't work. Mm -hmm. And that uh, some pills work for some situations, other pills for other situations. Mm -hmm. So this is a type of more nuanced view that we have to promote uh, and is supported by the evidence. And the last thing I want to say is it has to do, uh, another value is to be able to measure these executive functions in children so that you can tell and, and measure other things too at the same time so that the teacher can get a clue about the, uh, a child who seems to be doing well academically is one situation but is harboring a lot of stress that can be picked up in a variety of ways, which we don't have time to go into the details now, but through these same types of programs and interfaces, you can't expect a teacher with all the demands they have on them with a class of you know, 25 children to be able to get to that level for the child who's doing well. I mean, they're going to just leave that alone. We also have discovered children who are not doing well and have very strong cognitive skills that the schools are not aware of. And then when we're able to point that out, it's a whole nother conversation. It's like, why? And then you might start mm -hmm. thinking that there are emotional things going on at home and they can't do homework or they're distracted for other reasons, but it's a different view of that child than if you think they're just cognitively limited. Some kids aren't. So being able to measure uh, executive function as well as improving it, and actually these technologies now enable us to do both. We, just as an example, I mean, we have a paper already published several years ago called Measuring and Improving Executive Function in the Classroom with a thousand students across the country. And um, so that can, that's an important dimension and we have to get that recognized. I wanna yeah. try to get, I think there was. There's oh, one over okay. there, yeah. Yes, I'm Linda Gaskill and I'm a school psychologist in Prince George's County Public Schools. I don't know if it's on. I think it might not be on. It's on now. Okay. okay. I'm Linda Gaskill, and I'm a school psychologist in Prince George's County Public Schools with my, here with my colleague, Enid Amos. And we're excited that teachers are learning about executive functioning, and we're excited that um, there are programs and interventions that will 
um, be used in professional development with teachers because uh, many times we have students, and, and one of my questions was being answered by the panel and um, by Dr. Wexler, um, because we do see students who have specific disabilities and who have um, self-regulation uh, difficulties that exceed that of uh, most of the students in the general education classroom. So I was wondering if there are specific programs. I hear tools mentioned a lot, <laughs> and I wondered if there were specific programs that um, are better suited for students who do have self-regulation uh, difficulties. And, and before you answer that, also I had one concern um, with the uh, mandating of, uh, of meditation and yoga. Um, are there any problems with, um, uh, with parents who may not be on board with that? Because there are some religious um, differences that um, would exclude students from those types of programs. So when you say mandated, that concerns me. So I use the word mandated. Uh, I mandated the use of Inner Explorer as a program for our schools to we use it as a brain break and meditation slash just understanding of where you are and we have not had any pushback and we have a, a very diverse population and the, the term mandated for me was that I wanted people to understand it's very important for those students uh, to take that break because we live in a very stressful world and I walked into a district that was actually one of the lowest ranks if not I think it was the lowest ranked school in the state of New Jersey and yeah, but we, we actually had the lowest uh, test scores and the lowest compliance scores in the state of New Jersey. And over the three, four years that I've been there, we have raised uh, the compliance scores by 350% and the test scores by 6% every year. So we've seen growth. The mandate came as a, as a, from me saying we need to do these type of things as a father of three, knowing that everybody needs a brain break. That we haven't had the pushback from, from any religious organization. And, we, and again, that very, very, very diverse group, just understanding when parents do con are concerned with it, I explain to them that we need to have a child have a break during the day. So parents, do parents get an opportunity to sign off if this is something they want the, for their So it, we can't, while I'm mandated in the schools, any parent who doesn't want to participate, they're welcome not to participate, any student who doesn't, but we haven't had one say no. They recognize that this is an important aspect of, of, their, um, of their child. And, and going back to the question about, I think when you asked the question about the why, perhaps one of the greatest things of why I have, a, I ask that why every day is when people start to realize how difficult schools are these days. Uh, you know, everyone is, everyone has, remembers their day in schools as being an easy day, and I'm sure you know it as a school psychologist. Those days have changed. We, society has changed dramatically over the last 40 years. And I, a lot of people out there do not recognize that in schools. There are still people who, who think that every student is prepared for school, ready, well fed, um, you know, done all their homework, has nothing else in their life and they're focused. And that doesn't exist. And I have had a fortunate career of working in the, one of the highest um, income districts in the state of New Jersey and now working in a very low income district. And it goes across. It's different. I wouldn't say it's. I wouldn't say it's lower. I would say it's different, right? So whether they go to a five million dollar home and there's no one there to say I love you, or whether they go to a rent subsidized apartment that no one's there to say I love you, that's still the same. No one's saying I love you, and that's interesting. And I and I've done a lot of talk about. You know, we talk about attendance as requirements, and there's a lot of research in the low income homes who are kids who are not attending school, but. I can show you anecdotal data from when I worked in the, one of the highest districts that those kids would go away on vacation, have the same number of absences. Unfortunately, or fortunately, however you want to say it, they had tutors to make up the work. That doesn't mean a school is bad if the students are absent. It's how are they, get, how are they learning? And that's where sometimes we lose track of, that it doesn't matter what income you come from. It's a, it's a child. So we, we work together as a, as a community, as everyone, to try to help children. And I think a lot of people don't realize how difficult the world of a teacher has become <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, with parents constantly, again, across the spectrum, and the demands of what has changed and the mandates that we have on a regular basis to try to help a child who is just a child, mm -hmm. who, who is affected by life. 
and we're trying to cope with it. I'm sure as a school psychologist you know what I'm talking about. I've, I've had kids come in the day of a state test where a parent dropped them off and said, my parents are getting divorced, and state mandates say we have to give them the test. So we're giving that child the test knowing they're going to fail. And no one's answering the phone when we say, do we really have to do this to this child? And you still do. And, and that's just a hard decision. Just to answer the first part of your question, I know that the report has a number of different programs. I'm not sure how detailed it goes into which particular groups of students. I know it does do some detail. Um, but also in a lot of the randomized control trials and things you might find either in here or What Works Clearinghouse or any of those, it, it can be very helpful to look at the specific populations and go from there because as they've said, there are interventions that are looking at general populations and then others that are for very, very specific populations. And I think we've run out of time. So thank you very much to our, our group, if you can join me for thanking them. And I'm going to pass it back to you. I'll close quickly because I know we've gone over at that, and part of that is because I have been listening raptly to all of you um, because once this is over, it's our job to act and partner with those of you that we've met in the education community, learn from you, partner with all the folks in the room who came because they care about this. Um, you know, we were kind of an impatient bunch at Brain Futures. Um, 2015, it's 2019, we, we are eager um, to understand and learn how we can move the dime on this. I do want to thank our team. We've got the Triple K back there, Karen Kelly and Khadija. Susan recently joined our team, even though her name begins with an S. We <laughs> have brought her in, but the team has worked um, really hard. We have a number of our board and advisors here. There are many scientists and innovators that have volunteered their time. Um, to this project, and I want to thank you all and let you know that we are eager to work with all of you, learn from you, and build coalition um, to make things happen for kids. So thank you for being here today.